Are you ready? The Cornelia Stephanie Show. Wake up to love your call to action. Join Cornelia as she empowers others to live heaven on earth. Cornelia teaches listeners how to be the authority over yourself, embracing your inner guru. Feel yourself uplifted into limitless expansion, integrating ease and grace in a changing world. This show will cover topics such as unconditional love, your physical body, how to be in extraordinary relationships, create financial and emotional wealth, embracing entrepreneurship in the new earth. Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to the Cornelia Stephanie Show. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with you. We have our stories of hope today, and I'm excited to introduce you to our first guest, Tina C. Hines. She's a fifth generation healer, intuitive clairvoyant and medium. She's certified as an international transformational specialist. She dedicates her life to guiding emotionally wounded women on transformative journeys towards self-love, self-care, and self-worth. Welcome to the show today, Tina. It is a pleasure to be here with you today, Cornelia. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh, it's so wonderful <laughs> to have you. And honestly, I have never had a person on the show, and I've done many of these, that has been a fifth generation healer, which right away really? makes me curious, uh, <laughs> because that 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 gives me all kinds of curiosity, thoughts about, you know, what that means. Why don't you mm -hmm. tell me what that means? So fifth generation, um, I, I always like to share the story of how I, how my gift revealed itself to me. Um, versus me finding it. Most people are on a journey searching for their purpose. Well, my purpose found me. I, I didn't find it. Um, <clears throat> it started out as I was going, working through clinical depression. And at the same time of experience clinical depression, I was also going through an awakening. And I started seeing the spirits of my grandmothers around me. And mm. it made me very uncomfortable. Initially, um, I had gotten um, a Reiki clearing from someone. And then I, when we finished the, the, the meditation, I'm, I, I'm coming back to the space and I'm crying and she's like, what's wrong? And I was like, I saw my grandmother and I don't know what the hell is going on. And um, so what was great was that she specialized in this and she was able to share with me what I was experiencing. And then I started going to family members, asking them, had anyone had any type of metaphysical experiences. Um, and everybody kept passing me. My mom's the oldest of 10 and everyone kept telling, go talk to this one, go talk to this one. And eventually they led me to my, my grandmother's niece, um, my grandmother's niece, who's currently 92 years old. Her, her mother and my grandmother were sisters. And so I told her, I says, you know, I really need to pick your brain. And she's like, why, what's going on? And I says, well, I'm seeing Nana and I'm seeing your mother and I'm seeing grandmommy as well as some woman. I have no idea who she is. And she asked me to describe her. And as I'm describing her, she goes, oh, that's your great, great grandma, Jenny. You're just like her. And I've been waiting for you. And, oh my God. <laughs> and that's how she told me I had to give. You're just like her. And I've been waiting for you. And she had a picture of our great, great grandmother in her house. And she showed me the picture. And I'm like, yeah, that's the woman I've seen. And she started sharing different stories with me. Um, my grandmother actually had dreams. And I, we had the pleasure, our family has the pleasure of having my grandmother's journals. And she wrote her, journal, her dreams down. And what's so great with, with that is some of those dreams I remembered, um, coming to fruition. And my aunts were like, well, there's no way you would remember that you were too young. And I was like, no. And I started giving them descriptive pieces of the, that dream that my grandmother had written down. Um, so through our family unit, um, my mother who is still alive, she has the gift of sight. My grandmother, again, she had dreams. Her sister could lay hands on people and heal them. Um, their mother, had the gift of sight and my their grandmother had all the gifts and i am lucky enough to have all the gifts and so that's how it's fifth generation what an honoring yes 
what an honoring for you and also an honoring for them, their legacy and, you know, the journey that they, the gifts that they had. And I'm sure, you know, over the course of time, uh, a lot of the, the medicine, the gifts were meant to be suppressed and dumbed down and numbed mm -hmm. down and held back. And uh, there you are uh, remembering and mm -hmm. coming full, full circle and in full honor. I love that word honor mm -hmm. uh, to remember and share your gifts. Yes. I, I It's always just so interesting as, um, you know, when I talk to my cousin and she always ends the conversation with Tina, you know, you can't stop. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And when I reflect on, as I said, I got the pleasure of meeting all of them except my great, great grandmother. Um, but my grandmother, my great grandmother, they were alive um, while I was still like in my up to my teenage years. So I've always had the pleasure of meeting them and getting to know them and the work that they did. For example, you know, my grandmother worked with women, infant and children's. So everything was always working with women. Um, my grandmother, my great grandmother, she was the wife of a Pentecostal minister. So she worked in the ministry. And so everybody had their role, but it always seemed to surround working with women. And so they laid the foundation of this work that I am currently doing. I didn't find out I had my gift till I was 40. So it's been 16 years. I'm 56 years old. Like, unlike most people who may have known since they were a little kid that they had some type of intuitiveness or vision, I did not, I wasn't aware of it until I was 40. Do you believe or feel, maybe know, that your depression was linked to that not having been revealed yet? Oh, most definitely. I yeah. always say that um, the, the depression was the way to get me quiet. Um, a lot of times we are so busy, there's a lot of noise around us and within us. And there are spirit always identifies ways to get us quiet. And I feel that depression was what allowed me to stop and be able to have a different level of awareness. Um, you know, the trigger for the depression was my mom getting sick. Um, I'm, I'm an only child and she had a, suffered from a ruptured cerebral aneurysm. And so there were a lot of decisions that I had to make on her behalf during that time. And in the midst of taking care of her for a month, a month and a half, I was so busy taking care of her that I forgot to take care of me. And so that's where the, the coming back home, because we lived in two different states, coming back home and just almost like checking out. And I started, I went back into my same routine and one day my boss like asked me, she's like, Tina, are you okay? And the common normal thing that we always say is I'm fine. Yep. We said, cause we don't want to end up with the rest of the conversation. If we say we aren't, we aren't fine. Right, right. So I said, I'm fine. And I crossed the threshold of my office. I took two steps and I turned around and I looked at her and I says, I'm not fine. And it's taking every ounce of strength for me not to crawl under my desk in the fetal position and cry. Nice. Nice. That's real. Yeah. That's real. I had, to be real. I had to be real with myself about it, about how I, right. how I was feeling and not feel like I had to suppress it and be okay for everybody. Yeah. And yeah. literally that's what I said to her. I was like, I don't want to be my mother's daughter. I don't want to be my son's mother. I don't want to be your assistant. I simply want to be, I just need to be, and I don't even know what be looks like in this moment, but I just, I need to check out. <laughs> And what was great was she created a space for me to actually check out. And literally I had just come back and within two weeks I was leaving again because I needed to go on my own journey of healing now that I have taken care of everybody else. And what was great is I have um, a tribe of phenomenal women who have always been around me to support me and help me, which allowed me to just step away and focus on myself and my healing. How did she respond when you said what you said, right? When you said what you said, how did she respond to you? Like, was she uh, in shock or 
Uh, how how did she respond to that? I don't. I, I honestly don't feel that she was in shock. Um, I I don't know at what year we were probably into our eighth year of working together. And okay. By trade, she's a geriatrician, so she's a doctor, so she can sense when something is not right. Okay. And her her response, she's always had this nurturing demeanor, and her response was, "How can I best support you? And what do you uh, need to do?" Oh and my so, god. So again, I was honest with, I just need to step away. I says, I just can't process everything that I need to work through when I have to come back here and get back up to speed. And even when I was away taking care of my mother, I was still trying to take care of her in the job. And what was great was she paused me one day because I was calling in, checking in, making sure, because it's the CEO of the company. I want to make sure she was okay. And she stopped me one day in the middle of our phone call um, because she was being very supportive to help me understand a lot of what the doctors were telling me about my mom. And then, um, so she says, um, I need to ask you a question. And I want you to be honest. And I go, yes. She goes, do you, in this moment, do you need to be a daughter or do you need to be my assistant? This is when my mom was in the hospital before I came home. And I says, I honestly need to go and be a daughter. And she's like, that's what I want you to go do. But I had to have you make the decision. So I want you to go be a daughter. Don't call me no more anymore. <laughs> um, go take care of what you need to take care of. So she's always had this level of awareness and very supportive nature. So that made it a little bit easier for when it was time for me to take care of myself, for me to be okay and comfortable enough to share that with her. What a fabulous, this is such a fabulous story. This is, you know, your boss created such a space of safety for you. And mm -hmm. I just, you know, this needs to be in all working relationships out there. Uh, that model in itself, what she created for you is so wonderful. Uh, and the questions that she asked you, that that's so great. Um, Tina, I would like to ask you uh, right now, would you like to come back to the Cornelia Stephanie show where we could do maybe an hour podcast and we can talk a little bit longer because I, I really appreciate what you're sharing here with us today and um, you know, what you've learned. And so, you know, these 15 minute segments go by so quick. They're meant to inspire hope, for people that are tuning in and that are listening, uh, different perspectives. And so let's tell the audience how they can look you up and follow you on social media. I know that you said you had a following on TikTok. Yes, I am on TikTok under Tina C. Hines, which is my full name, T-I-N-A-C-H-I-N-E-S. Um, the same for Facebook, Tina C. Hines, Life Transformation Specialist. And Instagram, I am Tina C. Hines 50. Um, but if you look me up, you'll see this beautiful woman with this blonde hair um, uh, yeah, you <laughs> on are. all of the all, all the platforms. <laughs> That's so great. And um, know everyone that she uh, is dedicating her life, she's dedicated her life to guiding emotionally wounded women uh, on a journey towards self-love, self-care and self-worth. That's what she's doing. And so and remember all her modeling in the past has been about centered around women. So she's keeping that legacy gone. And we appreciate that because it is women rising. It is the divine feminine rising. And so it's perfect. Uh, so any final words you want to say to the audience where they can I, look at you one more time? Um, you can find me again on all social media platforms under Tina C. Hines. And I just want to encourage you to, lean into your greatness and start living your life unapologetically abundant. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, we're going to take a break on the Cornelia Stephanie show. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone. Our next guest today is Stacy Johnson, LPCC. She is a dedicated, passionate clinical therapist and women's empowerment coach who is trained in mindfulness and emotional freedom techniques like tapping. Stacy specializes in helping high achieving women break free from the cycle of overthinking, burnout, and stress. 
With a deep understanding of the unique challenges faced by ambitious women, she empowers her clients to reclaim their presence, enhance their well-being, and thrive both personally and professionally. Welcome to the show today, Stacey. Thank you, Cornelia. I'm so thankful to be here. It's awesome to have you. You know, the first first thought that comes to mind when I read about ambitious women, um, it makes me think of A-type personality women. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Is that, would you think that's true? Yes. Yes, I right. I do. Yeah. So a type personality women are women that are just always, you know, do, 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 go, 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 do, 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 and achieve, 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 and forgetting about them, their womanhood. Yes, this is correct. And they're, I, I also describe it as being on autopilot. They're just going every day and they don't take that moment to recognize them on their own selves. Mm-hmm. And I also see, you know, I was one of those women, mm-hmm. you know, not so long ago where I, you know, just was continuously going and not recognizing the time that I needed for myself. And then mm-hmm. I also started you know, arguing over the silliest things, you know, someone would ask me, you know, what is for dinner tonight? And I would blow up, you know, and so I was taking it out on the people that were closest to me. And that just wasn't working anymore. Yeah, because even like, as you're talking about it right now, you know, because we have so much on the go, there's so many things to do. There's, you know, there's just a lot going on. Uh, Aside from, you know, the, you know, working two jobs, some people, family, elderly parents, aside from all those things. uh, I'm finding for me personally, right now, what's really important to me is uh, my my daily mundane life, and how I want to live it. Mm hmm. Right. How I want to live it. And like what's important to me uh, in with my values and am I living my values and am I being, uh, you know, true to that, what it is that I want to create? Mm-hmm. Uh, do you find that the ambitious women, they they are f- far from that and they are possibly uh, running after an old program that this is what they should need to do because da 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 da. Yes. Is that what it is? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. And also, I just see a lot of women overthinking. So yeah, those negative self talk in regards to you know I have to do X Y and Z because you know especially with social media that plays a play. You know, like we're always comparing ourselves to other people, and so. I see, you know, women saying like they have to have like everything in place, you know, because of, you know, comparing themselves to others and then, yeah, this, and then not knowing their own boundaries about saying no, like continuously saying, yes, I can do that. And then not really putting into effect or like their own time, you know, and I, I used to do that all the time. You know, my kids were younger, they were in sports. I was working full time, most of the time, 40 to 50 hours a week. And, you know, I would have someone say, Hey, can you do this bake sale? Or can you do this? Sure. I can do that. You know, and then getting irritated with myself and then yelling at the, again, yelling at people around me when I'm trying to fit in you know, baking a couple dozen of cookies after working an eight or nine hour day and getting home late from a baseball practice or whatever with oh, my yeah. kids. Yeah, that that seems like a lot. No wonder you were, um, you know, yelling uh, when somebody <laughs> asked you what's for dinner. And, and <laughs> right. no wonder it's like you just can't do one more thing. Right, right. First of all, you can't just do one more thing. But second of all, um, where are you? What's it, you know, when is it going to be your turn? Right, right, right. Yeah, right. So the burnout and the stress is real because it causes all kinds of, um, you know, issues in the body. It does. Uh, it, it causes all kinds of things. Like even I'm in the process right now of, I really want to shed some menopausal weight that I had put on. And um, so I'm on my very strict uh, walking 
I like my walking and I, if that's where it's also a way I connect with nature and it's Yep. quiet. And I, I love that part. Right. And so last night with all the fireworks going off, we have, we live close to the tribal reservation there and they, they firework all night long. So it really disrupts with my sleep. And so um, I wasn't happy about that. I only got three hours of sleep last night because of the fireworks all night long. Okay. Mm. Mm hmm Because I know my body isn't going to lose weight right if I'm under stress. right right Right? exactly yep Which is why you do the work that you do, because in order for women to really, you know, again, go move into the abundance of their spirit and, you know, create a wonderful life, you have to be able to release some of the old habits and patterns and all the things that sabotage you. from, you know, stress and burnout. Right, right. Yes. And that's um, about 15 years ago was when I kind of had my biggest breakthrough is that I started to recognize that, yes, I was just go, go, going. And I was not taking care of myself. So I would have this constant heavy feeling in my chest. Like you, I, like every time I took a breath, it felt like I was just like sighing all the time. Or I had this tension that went along my back of my neck and would cause frequent headaches. And then I also started seeing that my kid, my younger girls at the time, they were young, they were not managing their stress well. So they were more irritable. And so I was not modeling the right way to manage stress and burnout. And so I really started to make some changes and I saw some significant changes when I did that, not just for my own physical health. I, you know, I stopped having that tension and the headaches went away, but my kids started to manage their stress better. I wasn't irritable and I was not yelling about who was going to make dinner or, you know, if a kid asked me, you know, can you help me with my homework or oh, I forgot to tell you, but I need this for a project tomorrow. I need to go to the store. So I really saw a change. And then um, a couple of years ago, um, about two and a half years ago, my husband passed away suddenly. Um, Oh. first, I had my stepfather pass away. And then three and a half weeks later, my husband passed away. So my body experience, I mean, it was this huge trauma But because I had given myself the skills to manage stress, you know, so many years ago, I was more resilient than I thought. And I was able to manage that stress pretty quickly. You know, I was able to get back to work, manage my household by myself. And I didn't feel that burnout feeling that I did even 15 years ago when I had a partner that could help me do some of the things that, you know, That's I a had. great story. That's a great story. You built up a lot of um, strength and resilience uh, Mm-hmm. over over the years, and then when the big when that big event happened, which is huge, um, you were able to really step in because you were part of it. When I say you, I don't mean the ambitious part of you, but the part of you that was neglected or abandoned. Mm-hmm. Right. That's so good. And how old are your daughters today? Do you just have daughters or sons too? I, I have daughters. They are 22 and 20. 22 and 20. You know, I, what I love, I love a lot of things you said, but what I really, really love is I cannot model uh, to my children the proper way if I'm not living it myself. In so many words, you said that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think if all parents took that Um, stand for the things that's important to them, whether it's self-care, uh, no matter what it is, but that that we model it. Uh, first, we have, to, we have to be that role model because those children, they need an archetype to look at. What is, what, do I want to be like that? Right. Right. We've all said, oh, I don't want to be like my mother. <laughs> right. We've all, we've all said that, right? Right. There's those rare few people that can say, oh, I want to be just like my mother because they're, you know, that, that it's a whole different thing. But most of us have said, no, I don't want to, I don't want to be like that. Right. 
Right. So, and you've obviously um, seen the shift in your daughters and they're doing well. Yes, they are. Uh, they've they've actually managed the trauma pretty well too. Um, we've had some physical um, issues that we've had to deal with. Um, one has migraines. And so we're working on some techniques to help her get through that um, because now she has started school um, as a full-time nursing student. So the stress from that and the trauma of her dad has been impactful for her, but she is managing pretty well. And then the other one started, she was a senior when her father passed away. So she started college and um, she has found her outlets um, with her sports and, um, you know, and yeah, they, they, for the most part, they were pretty resilient as well. That's good. That's really good. I want to be able to tell the audience how they can look you up on social media. Where are you active where people can find you? Uh, Facebook and Instagram at Stacy Johnson Coaching. And I have a website that's also Stacy Johnson Coaching. Yeah, it would be great, uh, Stacy, to have you on in the future again for a longer conversation uh, okay. where we can go more in depth about a different different subjects. But, you know, I, I we didn't touch on it, but your dad passing, um, your husband passing, that is a whole thing in itself, right? Right. We, right. That's the whole thing. So I'd love to talk with you more about it. Okay. Yeah. That'd be that great. Sounds great. I will have our beautiful Ashley message you and we can, she can set us up via email and we okay. can time. So, well, thank you. Uh, thank Stacey you. For coming on. We're going to take a break on the Cornelia Stephanie show. We'll be right back. Our next extraordinary guest today on the Cornelia Stephanie show, Yvonne Caputo, has been a teacher. She taught in the Erie, Pennsylvania public schools for 18 years. She has been, she's also been the vice president of human resources. This is important. At a retirement community, a corporate trainer and a consultant and a psychotherapist. She has a master's degree in education and clinical psychology. Her book, Flying with Dad, is a story about her relationship with her father through his telling of World War II stories. Her second book, Dying with Dad, shares how she and her dad had tough conversations about what he wanted in the end. She has always been a storyteller, and she has used stories to widen students' eyes and soften clients' pain. It's her stories that result in, have, in raves reviews as a presenter and as a speaker. Welcome to the show today, Yvonne Caputo. Thank you. It's great to be here. So it's so interesting. When I was reading your bio uh, intuitively right away, uh, even before I, I asked you, what do you want to talk about today? What I wanted to talk about. I already asked you <laughs> what you wanted to talk about. But what I wanted to talk about is I wanted to talk about uh, what did your dad want in the end? That's That was my question. That was my question. So you we can tie it together. You can give me mine at the end. Uh, but because okay. I want you to be able to set it up for, for uh, everyone uh, that what you said to me during before we before we came live of what you want to inspire people to do. And go ahead. What dad wanted in the end was to be carried feet first out of his own home. And I knew that what dad was saying to me is that that would be on a gurney, that he would be taken out of his house after he had passed away. Um. You mentioned my working in a retirement community, and that's how this all started. I was on an ethics committee, and we had a resident who was in end stages of dementia, could no longer speak for herself, needed some treatment, but the daughter thought that the treatment would not enhance her quality of life. And quality of life had been something that was legal in another state, but it wasn't legal in Pennsylvania. So it ended up that this case went to court and the court provided a surrogate so that the treatment could be given to the resident. 
However, if the treatment didn't work, then the daughter could step in again and say, let mom go. When we, when we did this, I was like, oh my God, I have a father. He's a riddle diabetic. I know he has a will, but does he have an advanced directive? And that's the legal document that tells what somebody wants in the end. And it says who is going to be the healthcare agent who can speak for someone if they can no longer speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. So I called dad on the phone and said, do you have this document? He said, no. I said, if I set it up for us with an attorney and I come back to Meadville, six and a half hours across the state, will you go? And he said, sure. So we did it. And I felt pretty comfortable with that. But fast forward to finding a document called the five wishes. And one evening in my office, I picked it up off my desk and I started reading and I couldn't put it down because it asked questions that I had not even posed to dad. How do you want to be remembered? What did he want his children to know? What kind of a funeral did he want? How comfortable did he want to be in the end? And I knew, okay, we had the legal document, but I needed to go back to dad with this new document and start that with him too. Now I have to let your audience know he was a little gruff around the edges. Mm -hmm. So it I have one. I have one question. I don't like to interrupt because I, I I totally want you to be in your flow. But one question is the five wishes. Where did that come from? It comes from the five wishes organization. Okay. It's a okay. pamphlet that your audience can order, and okay. it's it's five dollars. Okay. Um. So going back to dad and gruff around the edges. Getting him to, to sit down and do something like this again, there was trepidation. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I drove back. He was in the hospital at the time. I walked in the room and he was in a good mood. And I said, can I go over something else with you? And he said, sure. So he pulled his legs off the bed, patted the seat beside him. There was my father's warmth. We had the tray table. And we sat down and we started to talk. And the way the five wishes is set up is they have a major question. And then underneath the major question, they'll ask some very specific kinds of things. So with the specific kinds of things, dad, what do you want for a funeral? Dad was Roman Catholic. I want a high mass. I want your husband to sing. I want the Ave Maria, I want the Lord's Prayer, and I want, say, our, I'm going to stall on this, Amazing Grace. Okay. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you will sing. Mm. And then he said, and you know that thing where people stand up in, in a service and they say all these kinds of things about you? I don't want that. Because if people haven't said it to me to my face, then they damn well better not say it at my funeral. My father. Right. <laughs> So question by question by question, we went over this. How do you want to be remembered for my work with the Red Cross? Well, what about your service during the World War? And he said, well, that too. What do you want us kids to know? He said, I want you to know that I loved you. I didn't always show it, but it was always there. So at the end of about 45 minutes, I walked out and got two people who would come in and witness my dad's signature. And there it was. So fast forward, dad's in the hospital again. He called me on the phone, absolutely livid, and said, why did you tell them that I could leave the hospital? I said, I told them you could go if you were ready, but it doesn't sound like you're ready, dad. And then 
his voice softened and he said, Yvonne, will you come home? I'm scared. Ugh. I said, I will be there in the morning. I can't come tonight. So I made arrangements for somebody to come and spend the night with him so he wouldn't be alone. I got there at about four o'clock in the afternoon and Cornelia, two hours later, he was gone. And it went exactly the way he wanted it. We found him face down in his bedroom. Not being a nurse and not knowing, I called emergency services. We got him out to the foot of the bed. The EMT said, it's not looking good. I said, then stop working on him. I showed them the five wishes. They said it was too old. I no longer believe that's true. So I called the hospital and said, you've got a do not resuscitate order for dad. They're bringing him in. Grace stepped in and the emergency room doctor called and said, you can stop working on him. So I laid down beside him, put my left arm over his chest, had my head on his shoulder, and I talked to him. I told him I loved him. I told him he was going to be with my mother, and he had wanted that for some time. And then, Cornelia, I did the glue. I said the Lord's Prayer in his ear, Ugh. and he was gone. Now, if you can imagine, EMTs put him on the gurney, take him outside. This is northwestern Pennsylvania. It's January. The snow is coming down an inch an hour. They set the gurney down by the ambulance. They had to take him in to pronounce. The doors of the ambulance were open, and the light was shining on my father's face. And it was this soft, sweet, smile. Mm -hmm. And I went, yes. <laughs> the EMTs looked at me like I'd lost any brain I might have had. And I said to them, thank you. Dad's wish was feet first out of his own home. And that's what you've done. Now, I'll tell your audience, do I grieve? Absolutely. Are there times when I miss him? I would like to make him one more pot roast dinner and then ask him all of the questions that I didn't get to ask him for the first book. However, what I experience with my father that I've not experienced with the loss of others, my brother and my mother included, was a sacred joy. So if I look at my dad's picture or if I see my dad or, or think about my dad rather this joy is also a part it's the paradoxical side of the sorrow but for other people if they could experience that sacred joy when they've lost a loved one that's my passion I'm with you on the movement. It's a movement. It's an educational way. It's a new way in moving forward. It's an honoring of our life, our legacy, uh, our ancestors, our mothers, fathers that, that um, you know, we're outliving and saying goodbye to. So it's important. What is your social media, how people can find you? They can find me primarily on LinkedIn and I do have a website. It's through my uh, publisher, Ingenium Books. Um, my Facebook, though, is private. Okay. Um, you and I should be friends on LinkedIn, by the way. And I'm going to have Ashley connect us so we can do the, have another show. And I, I know in the other show, I want you to say all these same things again. They? But then we're just going to be able to stay longer and talk longer. But I, I think it's so wonderful what you did, uh, what you're doing, how you honored your father's life. That warms my heart and also softness and grace to you for the grieving times of where you can't have another pot roast with him and you would really like to. 
but you were that advocate and you wanted to make sure that he got what it is that he wanted. And I want that too for people. So this is so beautiful. Um, what is the five wishes? Is it the five wishes.com? It's the five wishes.org. And it was developed by a man by the name of Jim Toy. I understand that it's legal in 42 states. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, this is wonderful, Yvonne. Uh, I just, you know, I, I we're going to talk again. And I just want to thank you so much for coming on and giving us a little piece of uh, the, the amazing work that you're doing, have done. And uh, the next question I'll be asking you when we see each other again is how do you want to be remembered as well? So thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, I'm I'm so lucky. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a break on the Cornelia Stephanie show. Everyone we will be right back. What a rich show today, everyone. Oh, my God. I am bouncing in my seat. Crystal Quaylar, she is a sober coach on a mission to empower Christian women to embrace sobriety and unlock their true purpose. Can you imagine what it would look like to be totally sober humans? Uh, you know, that that is a really awesome subject to contemplate. Crystal says, having triumphed over her own battles with binge drinking, God has led her to help others find freedom too. Uh, through that approach, they approach, she approaches this through a biblical and practical approach so women can break free for good. Welcome to the show today, Crystal. Yes, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Wow. So uh, I asked you what you want to highlight today mm -hmm. and what is it that you really want to zero in on? And you said? Living alcohol free and really developing a sober mind. So do you find that, um, because I know that you are a Christian woman. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and do you find that Christian women mm -hmm. are not sober? Yes. Yeah. And I feel like um, a lot of the times we can think that Christian women actually don't have trouble with alcohol. I feel like that's kind of um, just a lie that, that a lot of people believe. And truly, I mean, obviously I'm a Christian and I was struggling with binge drinking. And so I do see that a lot in the church and within Christian women. And I feel like a lot of women are struggling, especially in the Christian world, because they may feel like they have to be, you know, put up this certain facade or to quote unquote, be perfect. Yeah, I think this is, a, that was a real a key. I just want to make this acknowledgement mm -hmm. that um, our Christian women, you know, struggling with, with drinking. And I think that for you with this work that you're doing is to really call it out, uh, yeah. to call it out and to really put it there because there's probably a lot more than we know. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to support those women, because you are the messenger. Right. Right. You are the messenger and you're being called to mm -hmm. be fierce with your love, right? to be fierce with your message. And sometimes it's not the things that we like to hear. Right. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> why do you why do you think um, this is so hard for, you know, women to let go of? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I feel like whether it's women or just any human being, I think we've been really conditioned in this world to, to numb and to not really allow ourselves to really go through the human experience, which requires, um, you know, which requires going, having different emotions, right. Which requires going through life and life is not always perfect. Right. We go through different trials, tribulations, um, loss. Right. And so, you know, what I really do in my coaching that it really is a big part is just learning how to navigate your emotions and navigate your triggers and really learning how to go through that human experience again without numbing. But I feel like that's been such so ingrained in our brains that we just need a numb or we just need a pill or whatever that may be alcohol um, to just get through life. And that's just not the truth. Yeah. So you're a sober coach. So give me uh, prior to you being a sober coach, you were not a sober coach. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so what um what was your life looking like at that time before you were a sober coach like give me the give me the rundown yeah just in a nutshell um you know I I had alcohol in my life for probably over 10 years and I was never 
physically addicted to alcohol, but I did get really close. I was more so, you know, what people would say in the gray area drinking space or more so a binge drinker. So I could go months without drinking, but when I did drink, I would always overdo it. And I would repeat that over and over again. So I would go through different cycles and it really started to affect then my mental health where I was having what you would call, you know, um, anxiety. Um, I started to experience a lot of, you know, depression and just really that internal battle that was like, okay, well, you're living under your potential. I think that was the biggest thing. And then once I really found my relationship with Christ, I started to have that deep conviction that I was just living under my potential and not really allowing myself to walk fully in freedom. Yeah. And so since you discovered that, uh, Mm -hmm. that you, like you said, you could go months and then all of a sudden you would binge and Mm -hmm. then you would have to, you'd have to be in that for a while and clear through that and detox that. And then, Mm -hmm. then coming back to the purity of what it is that you really want to live. And like you said, in your, uh, you know, in, 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 in the image of Christ in the likeness of Christ in that way. So, um, How is it going? How long now have you been doing this? Yeah, so I've been, oh, I've been in the coaching industry for about seven. I've been sober coaching for about four years. Uh, And then I've been, uh, you know, alcohol free for over five years. I think it's going on six now. I kind of lost, lost count there. But yeah, so I've been in the game for a minute. (laughs) Yeah. So how, you know, how, how has the success been for the women that you've coached? What, what's the results? Yeah, no, it's been really amazing. And it's, it's honestly such an honor to be walking these women through not only living alcohol free, but also, you know, coaching them and mentoring them even just beyond the bottle, right? Because once we let go of the things that are hindering us, you know, the counterfeit identities, the things that we are using to numb, we then get to fully step into our true identity in Christ and really our true authentic self, which opens up the door for purpose and our calling, and just really doing the mission that we are called to do individually on this earth. So yeah, that's great. Uh, where where do you do you see like do you have how do people get in contact with you? Is it um, they're going to see you on social media? They're going to book an appointment, mm-hmm. and then they you know you guys have a discovery call, and is that how it's done? Yeah. So all of my clients are online. And so typically um, I do have a free community. So a lot of people will kind of dive into that first on Facebook, and then we will set up a um, typically a free sober strategy call just so we can kind of get to know each other and make sure we're a great fit for each other. And then we'll kind of move on from there, which typically leads to my 12 week mentorship. That's, that's pretty popular that a lot of people start on that helps build that foundation in sobriety and also, you know, living, um, you know, through the lens of Christ. Nice. So I like that you have that, that, that free community and that you're, you know, where people can just really experience it. And then also the 12 week uh, program. Yeah. And so do you have a good success rate with people that have gone, gotten that are growing with you Mm -hmm. in this new movement? Yeah, absolutely. I would say I have a pretty good success rate. And I think one of the reasons is too, is that we look through a different lens. And so we don't just focus just on counting days or, you know, even just labels. We really focus on building a fruitful life. And like I said, doing it through the lens of Christ and really um, focusing on life-giving habits. So essentially building that life that people want while simultaneously living that alcohol-free lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. So basically it's living an alcohol free life. Is it just Mm -hmm. alcohol or is it other things too? Uh, I, so they start off typically just being alcohol free, but as we work together, there are typically other idols, other, you know, um, things that people want to get rid of, even if it's just something as small as, you know, an unhealthy relationship with food, because typically that behavior will transfer something else if we don't get to the root of it. Good job. Good job. Good job. Yeah, I love it. I think it's great. I think it's a wonderful way to, um, to live. Mm -hmm. And um, lots of different things are going through my mind, but we are running out of time. We're going to be talking further because I I want to go deeper into it. Uh, Let's tell the audience how they can find you on social media, like where all the places and your website. Yes, absolutely. So um, the best place would be on Facebook in my free community. It's called the Kingdom Alliance Community. And um, also, I would say my email would be the best place if you want to set up a sober strategy call, which is my last name, C-U-E-L-L-A-R, first name, C-H-R-Y-S-T-A-L at Gmail. Excellent. Uh, Let's see. Yeah, so we've got all that. And then I just want to let you know, Crystal, is that when you're looking at the replay, for mm-hmm. people to watch this show, 
they're, they're going to be able to click that same link that you have, just so you okay. know. Okay. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Audience, I want to thank you so much, everyone, for listening and tuning in. I just feel so uh, inspired by all our guests today. It was just incredible leadership by in, in women in their field of expertise, what they're really excited about. So I hope that it served you and I hope you're doing well and we'll see you again next week, everyone. Take good care. Bye-bye. Thank you. You've been listening to the Cornelia Stephanie show, Wake Up to Love, your call to action. Tune in each week on Transformation Talk Radio. Cornelia's joy is to engage others in practical ways, showing us how to live in the new earth in harmony with our true nature. For more information on Cornelia and her extraordinary work, or to listen to past shows, go to her website at corneliastephanie.com.